Shout out to David at Pisa Gray Box for reaching out to me saying, hey, you meet us here. <laughs> yes, we sure would. So uh, thank you there, foundational sponsor. So for, the, for 2017, you meet roughly every other month. We now have stability in, in a venue, which is awesome, so we can focus on bringing in more great speakers. So I'm Wendy Maku. I'm a director of sales at Fortel. Um, myself and Brian um, uh, Taylor of Forex uh, run this group and um, Fortel, for those of you who don't know Fortel, we're a personalization platform. So we work with e-commerce companies to really help their shoppers uh, by providing personalized product recommendations and search and, and, uh, and, and all kinds of fun things. Um, I'm in sales there and uh, the reason I started coming to this group was I always want to know more about e-commerce. I sell and I work with merchants all day, every day. E-commerce is so complicated. There are so many things that you have to know and not only know, but stay on top of. And so that's what keeps me energized and excited about the space. Um, and that's what drew me to the group. And um, I met Brian at the group and Brian is with Forex. So would you like to introduce sure. Forex? Yeah. So, so um, I'm with Forex. We're, we're an e-commerce agency here in town, uh, specializing in Gentile. We're a, a top 10 rejection partner worldwide. And mostly what we do is we focus on driving results and outcomes for our clients. Like people turn around, show measured results, uh, some people show how many dollars came with every change we made. And so that's that's really our field. Um, but yeah, we you know, a lot of fun. We recommend Fortel all the time. So if you guys haven't heard about it, I've been recommending it all the way. So, well, thank you for that plug. Yeah. That was not intentional. Um, and um, they would you like to introduce Graybox. Sure. So aside from having this awesome space, they also offer some great services. Yeah, so uh, Graybox is a digital technology consulting company. Uh, we are based here in this awesome space here in Portland. Uh, about e-commerce, which is why we wanted to host the uh, e-commerce meetup group here. Um, about probably about a third of our clients are related to e-commerce in some respects, and we certainly got a few clients here, which is great to see. Um, and we also do digital marketing, uh, build web applications, mobile applications as well. Um, we do a lot of ongoing um, application support for a lot of our clients. Um, and uh, yeah, we're super excited to be involved in the e-commerce meetup group. And uh, we also have a handful of other kind of like businesses in the ecosystem around Graybox. Uh, one of which. Uh, Manages and uh, Amazon marketplaces for clients. Um, so if you're interested, uh, come and talk to me. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're super excited to be here. So thank you for yeah, uh, providing a, a home for us. We appreciate that. My goal is always to bring in merchants because I think they have the best stories. It's what I think most people want to hear about. Um, <laughs> ideally, it would be every other session. And I'm excited to introduce Ken of Grove May. Um, he kindly has stepped up to offer his thoughts on you know, understanding your customers. And uh, I appreciate your time and energy and, and sharing your story with us and the journey that you've been on. So thank you. Oh, 
Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here because um, this subject in particular is something uh, that I personally have been really poor at. So hopefully you guys will learn something from uh, the experience that I've gone through. So uh, I grew up here in Portland. Uh, quick background is um, I was a furniture designer for a long time. And one day a friend and I were throwing a football around. And he had the idea to make a bamboo iPhone case. Nobody would do it for him. So one day I decided to partner and go for it. So our business started more from kind of like this desire to create something rather than like a business plan. And you'll kind of see where that can lead. Uh, a big thing that was uh, differentiated us early on was that we manufacture our own products. So uh, we like to say that process matters. Uh, it's really distinguished us from the crowd. Uh, and we like to say people matter. This is, uh, this is our team. And uh, for a long time, we were very internally focused. We put a lot of thought into our culture, uh, how we do things, and making sure the team happy. And I really believe that would lead to success long term. So I put a lot of thought into the why. Like, why are we doing this? And for a long time, it was centered around my personal why. I really like to make stuff. I want to have a meaningful life. And uh, fortunately, we never really thought about this. So what about these people? These 80,000 customers we've had. I have to admit, I never thought about them. Uh, we got away with it for a long time because we basically got lucky. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I heard somebody say everyone successful has been lucky at least once. There was a lot of luck involved. Our company took off. We had a product that resonated with people, and we had the luxury of never having to think about our customers. So last summer, we started thinking about why do our customers care? And it was a massive question mark. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know. Uh, out of those 80,000 people, I probably met 40. That's uh, less than a fraction of percent. So we went on this journey last uh, last summer to discover who our customer is. Um, level one is kind of the obvious stuff, the data. Um, you guys know all the tools, Google Analytics, uh, Facebook. We found out that our customers tend to be a little bit younger than you think. They're kind of uh, the biggest group is millennials. They tend to be creativity focused. Uh, they're heavily male. Um, so level two is surveys. So this can be interesting because you can get insights you can't get from from, my, uh, from data. In particular, I like uh, asking, uh, like leaving an open field, and people just start writing stuff. Like sometimes it's really negative, but but um, like for example, here we have 488, and I actually read every single one. Um, or like this survey, we figured out why people weren't actually. All right, next step. Online research, aka cyber stuff. <laughs> so, uh, I want to introduce Jim. Yeah. He's our chief marketing guy, and he had this idea, which is uh, stupidly simple but uh, incredibly effective. We went through our customer list, we looked at a day's orders, and we just started Googling every single one. Every single one. We just, there were, there were four of us, and we were just like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. and it's actually really fun. Uh, we found that uh, a lot of our people are uh, incredibly successful. You know, we found that uh, people are photographers, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, founder of this, founder of that. And what we did is uh, we made a template uh, where Jim made this template where you can see the person, what they purchased, and then we'd find whatever data we could find and put it right there. And that makes it visual, right? But what we did is we printed them all out and we covered four, four by eight boards. So suddenly, it's not just data, you're like looking at real people. Um, right, next level is uh, video interviews. So um, out of the surveys, we asked people, hey, are you willing to talk to us? So we did uh, 30 surveys, or 30 interviews for about 30 to 45 minutes each. And we go in deep with these people. We'd ask them like, hey, where did you grow up? What do you like to do? How did you discover us? Um, and the people were really interesting. Uh, a couple of people stand out. This guy, Kemper, he is uh, probably like 25 years old. Incredibly nice. 
incredibly nice. I just, I just couldn't get over how much this guy smiled. It like made me like really self-conscious about myself. Am I a dick? <laughs> like I felt like uh, he was so positive. And uh, what was interesting about him is he had bought our desk collection products even before he had a desk. He, he didn't have his first job. But he um, she was the seventh employee at Lyft. Uh, there was another guy that really stood out. I can't remember his name, but um, he, he worked for a medical startup. And he was doing some kind of technology stuff, super hardcore. Knew everything about our brand, other brands. And uh, we asked him, like, hey, what are you doing on the weekend? I want to get to know who these people are. And his answer was ER doctor. That's what he does for fun, is he's in hardcore. Yeah, that, that's kind of the profile. I mean, I'm a little exaggerated, but our customers are really hard driving, hard working people. So, keeps escalating. <laughs> uh, I was going on vacation anyway, so I was like, maybe I'll just go meet these people in person. <laughs> so, I piled into my uh, girlfriend's little Fiat, uh, full of camping gear, believe it or not, and headed uh, to Montana. So I kind of headed out with not much of a plan. Uh, I just wanted to meet these people and interview them. And when I got there, uh, the first person I met with was uh, Kirk Cornelius. So he lives in Kalispell, Montana. He used to live here. He was a uh, uh, VP of business development at Ziba Design. Yeah. But he got laid off. And he decided uh, that's an opportunity for him to start his own business, too, uh, digital music and something. So he moved out to Montana to this gorgeous house. And when I got there, uh, I kind of had like an a hobbyist photographer, and his house was just gorgeous. And uh, I thought I was just going to be there for like an hour to interview him. I was there for six hours. He showed me around his house, uh, pointing out every little object that he owned, the story behind it. Like, hey, this painting was done by my grandfather, who grew up in India. Or uh, see these objects here. These are from the original people that owned the house before. I bought at the state sales. Uh, he was a very, very sensitive guy about his objects. Uh, I learned his life story that he was a, a musician when he was younger, and he got into being a band manager. And then through a stroke of luck, he ended up working at an ad agency because the guy who hired him had worked as a band manager before. And then that catapulted him to a very successful career in digital agency. So, uh, Sam is, uh, we got really deep. I wanted to find out like what really drives this guy, right? So, he told me his story all the way through his career. And uh, what really stuck with me about him is he told me his priorities had changed. So, he was like this hard driving work guy, and he lived in New York. And then he moved to Portland for the lifestyle. But then he had this uh, baby girl, Stella. And then he became even more family oriented, where his number one thing was time. So he decided, you know what, this is the perfect time for me to get away from this corporate thing. Just move to Montana and uh, live in this gorgeous home. So this is uh, the second person I interviewed, Megan Osborne. She's in uh, Whitefish, Montana. She's a uh, freelance graphic designer for Cisco Systems. Uh, she lives on this incredible property that her parents own, overlooking Lake, Lake Whitefish. It's got a view of the lake. And she actually lives in this uh, this barn. So inside the barn, there's like a boat. And then upstairs is her bedroom and work studio. So I've never seen <laughs> it's I was pretty envious. You get there, and it's like everything is just gorgeous. I could not believe her life. Uh, I mean, that's what she does in the morning. You know? Gorgeous. Check out the view at the office. Uh, she was super inspiring. Um, I've never met somebody that's like so positive and uh, what do I call it? grateful for where they are in life. And I, I really wondered where that came from. And I, and I think I started to get to know her a little bit better when we talked about talked through her life story. And she's really a family person. She uh, moved to Hawaii after college, studying fashion design, and she felt very homesick. So she came back to Montana and switched careers to graphic design. 
asked her why or how she got this job at Cisco. And she actually said it was through her Instagram feed. Apparently, that happens. She has an Instagram feed that's really focused on fly fishing. And somebody was following her because they like fly fishing. And that person is her current boss. So, of course, I asked her, can we go fly fishing? So this is only like 10 minutes away. We got in her car, went fly fishing, I snapped a bunch of photos. I was just eating it up. I was like, I can't do this. Um, you know, she she's an amazing woman. Um, what's what's really interesting is just, uh, you know, she changed as she realized her priorities. She became um, kind of aware that she really needed to be close to home, and she's leading this life that she's very grateful. Okay, this is the last guy I visited on the trip. This is uh, Greg Hennis. He's uh, the proprietor of the Jennings Hotel. Have you guys heard of that? It's this uh, new hotel out in Joseph, Oregon. That's kind of based on like the Ace Hotel. Yeah, you're nodding your head. It's kind of based on the Ace Hotel concept. So this guy was really fascinating. Um, he's got great hair, first of all. <laughs> like, I don't even know. Yeah. But he used to have a beard, which you'll, you'll see an epic beard. Um, so he's a uh, serial entrepreneur. His first company is called Clutch Camera. It rents camera gear to uh, professionals here in Portland. And his second company was um, pretty interesting. <laughs> so I'll show you a little clip. Uh, this, guy, this is his viral video that made his company take on. So that video is not totally random. So what he does is he starts these companies that are kind of like brilliant ideas. And at the beginning, he'll totally hustle and build them up. And then he designs them so you can build them up. So like that company, he sells literally a box with leaves in it for $12. <laughs> you know, right? And it's still ongoing. It just keeps on coming. He does no marketing. It just keeps on coming. So, like you get these people that have these brilliant ideas, and sometimes I wonder like, where does it come from. And I think I kind of started to understand from getting to know them a little better, um, staying at the hotel for a few days. So he really values space and time. Um, when he built up his first business, he would work for two weeks, or in the beginning he hustled and worked every single day, and eventually he got it to where he could work two days and be off two um, two weeks, excuse me, and then off two weeks, two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks off. And it's two weeks off. He was actually going to flying to Minnesota to build a cabin in the woods. And this guy's like totally extreme, right? And uh, what he really values is like that time away from his work. And he, he really believes that in order to, to take the next step and be at this like next level, he needs that space. So when I was there, he actually directly influenced my life because when I was there, he suddenly uh, was leaving. He's like, hey, I'm taking off. I hope you have a nice time. Asked him when he's coming back, and he said in a month. Uh, and I couldn't believe it because he just started this business like a year ago. And you know, I hadn't taken a month off in seven years, right? <laughs> so it's just like this guy had this different mentality about work, and it actually inspired me to take a sabbatical. 
which was uh, actually really helpful for me. So um, ultimately, on you know that slide at the beginning, I was talking about what do I, what do we care about, what do we care about, which comes from what I care about, and why do our customers care? I think this is, this trip really made me aware of the intersection, and our company. I think that's the next step for us. We've never really thought about that in an in intelligent way. It's finding out where is this intersection and how can we make sure our products are inside there. Um, it was a big relief for me because um, I'm kind of driven by what I want to do. I'm not the kind of guy that can do stuff that I don't want to do. And um, I realized that I can still stay within that and service our customers. I don't have to step out of it. Like, I don't have to go here, right? Here. Uh, the other two things that happened was um, I didn't realize that the meaning behind our products was was actually our customers and what they do with them. I didn't realize that our customers are using our products to elevate their work and their life until we talked to them, until I saw them in their homes, and it changed everything uh, for for us and for me personally, especially. Uh, we were always looking inwards for me, and we didn't realize that we we're actually spreading it out into the world. Uh, the other thing that happened is um, all three of those people have come visited me already. So, you know, at worst, I made some friends. Um, yeah, that's it. That's my customer discovery journey. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Questions. I'm curious about what happened uh, last summer that got you on this journey. Oh, right, right, right. So our company had been like doing really well. And um, so if, if I drew a graph of like our product performance, our ability to create good work, good marketing, and our company culture was going like this, right? And then our company was growing like that until suddenly a few years ago it started going the other way. So our company performance is going down like financially even though we're doing better. So I started thinking, like, what's going on? It's not what we're doing. Something else is happening strategically. What's the actions you're taking out of that to change the company and influence the future? Something uh, controversial, which would be interesting to talk about as a group. Um, we, we make a lot of different products. We started with the iPhone case, and we, we make the desk collection that you saw on the first slide. And we make um, everyday carry stuff like watches, knives, key rings, and stuff like that. We're actually considering um, really focusing on the desk, on, the, on work, being a company about making your work better, even though we carry all these other products, because that seems to be what ties in all these customers that are uh, more and more engaged. So that thing with the five levels, obviously, by the time you get to the fifth mm -hmm. level, it's like highly biased, right? Like I'm like handpicking my favorite customers. And then basically at each stage, it's getting more and more biased towards uh, people that are more engaged in your brand. Like even surveys, right? Like only people that care enough to answer the survey will answer. When you go to video interview, only people that care enough. But yeah, that's a weakness of doing that. But also it's identifying like, what kind of people are the most passionate about what you do. So we've considered uh, going that way. We're instead of presenting ourselves as a product something that does everything, like focusing in on the, the Megans and the Kirks and the Greggs. What do you think about that concept? It's a little risky. I've already talked about it a little bit. It's not in position, so I think it's good. So it's about half of our sales, though. Yeah. It's only half. I don't repeat those. Yeah. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that uh, dilemma? So it's about half of our sales is uh, the desk stuff. But our most powerful customers are all kind of about that. My thoughts are when you when you talk about the products you make, I, I have a modest level of engagement with that. But when you talk about providing things to help people work, mm -hmm. that's a story I can relate to. And when you talk about how you want to make the experience of work better, that's something that, that grabs me in a way that it doesn't when you just make products that happen to be very that. When you focus on how we work, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of traction there. How are you leveraging those stories kind of back to actually both your problems to actually market? Because 
the, even though they're all very different, the trend I saw through all three, and I'm sure you saw through other surveys, was not so much how you work, but the freedom that your actual work gives you. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's a creative outlet or, you know, mm -hmm. a living out in Montana and be able to that freedom. So identifying with the story, it, that kind of grabs you in a way that sure. um, a pro con listener mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like a crime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, the sets. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so last fall, I went to New York, and we did. I hired a like, photographer, a stylist. Models, we did this big photo shoot for LinkedIn. And then I did this photography myself, right? I'm not nearly at that photographer's level. But when I show it to people, they actually like this better. Yeah. And it kind of made us realize like, hey, the real customers are inspiring. The real stories are inspiring. We should make this into a lookbook and put it on our website, feature our customers, what our products do for them. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes you want to go to work. Like if you truly love what you do, you truly respect your workspace, and it's not a cute that you're stuck in nine to five. Yeah. Then, yeah, I want it to be pretty. So I'm proud of it. I'm proud of my work. I want it to express that. Um, is what I get. So kudos to you. That's awesome. Yeah, I was I was thinking that what you were saying about your customers that you know a lot of companies they strive to be like an aspirational brand, but but in a lot of ways like your customers are aspirational like themselves like. People want to be like them yeah. and like achieve the life that they have. Um, so, so I'm curious if you, in creating like a lookbook, if you have plans to like tell their story. Yeah. Right. yeah, I think we'll actually start out with these ones that we already have and see how that how that works. Um, it's it's a little tricky because uh, Jim in particular, he's one of those guys that wants to measure like measurable results. <laughs> Uh, how how would how do you, how would you guys suggest we measure the impact of something so conceptual? Anybody have any ideas? Instagram feeds. <laughs> That's so important. It's so aspirational. Yeah. Okay. So you said fifty percent of your sales currently are, are towards like work. Yeah. So are you are you launching new products focused on work? Um, kind of. It's still a mix. We haven't like fully locked into like we're doing this. Uh, so your um, your road trip and your uh, interviews kind of reminded me of this uh, blog article called um, I think it's called One Thousand True Fans, where basically the idea is that you um, you know you focus on the the, the true fans because uh -huh. those are the ones that will um, that will actually spread the word and that will um, you know actually talk about actively about the product and they're like active users. Uh, so, like, um, the question I have is, like, if you guys had any, like, ways to, um, like, kind of encourage those true fans to, like, you know, share more about your products or encourage that more? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a fun question because uh, in the customer interviews, our first motivation was actually to um, ask them if they want to be part of a referral program. And it was people who had clicked, like, yes, contact us. But by the time we had gotten to about five people, it became obvious that. It wasn't really working. Um, do you want to smile, Jim? Yeah, the problem was no one wanted to be incentivized to just spread the word. So we would, you know, we're just starting with the starting point of uh, traditional uh, you know, word of mouth campaigns where if you tell a friend or something, that just immediately turn people off. You don't want to buy lights. Yeah, no, no, no one wanted to be the guy that was selling something to their friends or it was just a complete turn off. So it just sort of became something that was like, well, we, you know, we spread the word then. Yeah. And there, was something, there was no program or initiative. Like anytime we tried to formalize the spreading, at least in the, the initial conversation, yeah, I couldn't think of a way to do it. Yeah. Come back there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, what did you provide the customer? Um, like, what did you offer them as a referral? Like, if they would have referred somebody where they didn't change. We were kind of those. Those are like what we were. What we were asking them. Like, what would you want? Oh. Um, or you know, just to kind of see or start the conversation. You know, if 
we had a way of tracking, you know, revenue that you essentially drove our way and then at a certain threshold you would get a percent off or something. Well, it goes into my second question about like retention. So what percentage of your customers purchase more than two to three times over the course of a year? Yeah, so that was one of the basic, basic questions we didn't have an answer to when we first started. I think now we know it's a little higher than one. One five quarters on average, something like that. Yeah. What's the price point for the products? Uh, our average order value is around uh, one fifty, and it they usually pile stuff on there. So, uh, it's about that whole set. It's like five hundred bucks, five hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And then where did the data come from? You started with this before you did surveys. So what, I mean, are you still looking at e-commerce sales data? Or are you... Yeah, we're looking at our own data on then um, Facebook. You can have this thing where you compare it to the average Facebook user. Um, we Google Analytics. Yeah. What's the most surprising piece of data that you've uncovered? Um, I'm always surprised at how male-dominated we are. So that was never the intention. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not surprising anymore. I just don't really know why. And the other one is age. Your products are, seem to be kind of, the feedback is that they're expensive, but the biggest cohort is millennials, 24 to 39. And then it just keeps going down from there. It seems like you guys are going to be really thoughtful about your customers and sort of respecting their points of view. I'm wondering how you guys made the leap to start asking questions in a way that's consistent with that thought process. Was it hard for you guys to just pull the trigger and start sending out surveys and asking for interviews? And, and how did you do that in a way that was kind of consistent with the care that you guys did? You know, I can talk a little bit about the resistance. Like I'm naturally introverted, and you know, I'm the kind of guy I used to like work alone in my garage like, making furniture, and it was like I was never trying to make money or spread it or anything, I just want to do it, right? So I think our brand has taken on that personality in the past where we're kind of like secret, you know? And we're very like shy about saying who we are. It was a big deal to kind of pivot to this. We're actually talking to people and thinking about providing something for them. Um, as far as your question of how to stay consistent, is that, is that your question? Yes. Kind of balancing that fine line of not being intrusive in people's lives with, right. you know, wanting to ask them questions that didn't matter. Oh, right, right, right. That, that's a good one because I never thought about this. So in the beginning, I think maybe I was feeling a little bit about it, but uh, we found Jim and I found that like these people wanted to talk. Like we have to get them off the phone. Yeah. It's like, like <laughs> forty-five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's like sorry, yeah. Most of these people are really engaged. Especially that ER doctor guy. He was, he was intense. <laughs> wow. Oh, night shift, too. That's his hobby. Night shift, ER doctor. Kind of looking back on this process, is there anything that you would want to do differently and you guys plan on doing this again? Yeah. Yeah, so it actually made us feel like we started knowing a little bit and it actually made us realize how much we've done. So I think this is. We're just going to start. We have to go a lot of people. You know, I can't give you answers right now as to what our customer really wants to still. So um, Nick's going to start doing some. Jim, Jim and I are going to do more. And uh, dig in. Actually talk to people. Genius. Are these customer insights going to change what how you approach your, your website and what sort of content or how you step up? Yeah, I think the way we pitch like the value in our company, you know, we're working on a redesign. A uh, we go with design inspires what you do. It's kind of the, the truth that we believe, um, and we think that that's what the customers believe. Uh, we don't really pitch anything. It's more like, hey, this is what we do, and we don't outright say that's the value to our customers. So like, you know, when, when your people in your company, you know, have this idea of what their customers are, and when they think they, they know what their customers are, and when you did this research, was there something that you thought, found out was completely different and 
a complete change in the spectrum of what the really customers are or what they're thinking. Because you know, sometimes clients kind of talk to themselves and have this thinking of like they know who their customers are, but like when they found five years ago, it's like totally different. Was there like a oh my god moment of like this is totally different? Well, I don't know about totally different, but I don't think I understood um, that what it was doing for them. Uh, I, could, I, I suspected that they were buying the stuff because of the design, but I never really thought about what the design was doing for them. Do you have any thoughts? I was going to say, I think one big surprise came more recently, it was more around the actually e comm stuff that we started that to see, which is really starting to see how much of our traffic comes from our, our original products, which is iPhone, which is sort of uh, made us feel all that much more vulnerable and just like straight up scared. It works that because not only is 50% of our revenue coming from that, but even more of our visitors are coming from that. It's a much bigger chunk. People who are searching, you know, Google iPhone case, we all have all the historic landing page and SEO juice that are landing on our site. And then we're lucky that some of them are crossing over and finding the other product and buying them, but still a lot of them are heavily siloed and just kind of so scary. <laughs> I didn't talk about the, the journey of our company too much, so I should explain. Like we started out with iPhone cases, right? And we blew up because we were putting raising grade guard on. And you know, overnight, almost, we had a business of like 25 people. And uh, what happened over the years is that market got more and more saturated. Uh, putting art on stuff was actually pretty easy. And uh, 2013, we lost a lot of money. In 2014, I was thinking about, like, hey, what do we need to do? And basically, what we did is we pivoted away from the art on the case angle. Because I really thought about, like, what do we do better than everyone else? What are we really passionate about? And it is, we make the product that so we decided to kind of kick, um, kick it in a different direction where we kind of abandoned that group and uh, used our energy towards developing new product lines. And the desk was one that thankfully took off. Right? Without it, we'd be out of business. Um, what was really interesting about that and, and relevant to what we're talking about today is we had to switch customers. <clears throat> so our old customers were all about the art. They loved laser gray. We have people still talking about it. That's like four years ago. We'll get like a comment in a survey. They just like sneak it in at the end, in that, in that box. They're like, bring the art back. <laughs> <laughs> but we should for sure lost some customers. But we just didn't see that that customer base being able to support our company in the long run because that market was getting so saturated with like Chinese stuff. Have you guys explored marketing directly to businesses if you're going to go to business? Trying to go sell 100 desks. Sure. Sure. Uh, we get some orders just coming in. Businesses that are like buying four to eight, maybe 12. We've had one big order. It's a company called Diesco. They make an iPhone app. That's kind of like yeah. a level one. They bought 150, maybe. <coughs> Target. So, yeah, we tried some B2B stuff and the Long story short is the infrastructure behind doing that successfully is essentially like rebuilding a small company within our company, and um, we don't have any outside uh, investment. We're just you know profitably making money, we made it on the growth, and so it was just kind of spreading out both on the sales and outreach, and then also fulfillment is different, scale bigger, planning out production. Suddenly that's totally changed up. The fulfillment is totally different. You're packing pallets instead of ones and QBs. So it's Basically, starting a whole company can go in and the, the cost is crippling and the dividing of focus and resources. So, we had to put the eggs on the basket that had the most sales. So. Also, with um, corporate sales, there's usually somebody that makes a decision. When, like when you guys move, you're probably like, let's come out the office. <laughs> right? And there's like a budget and somebody's making that call, right? Like, if I pissed you right now, you'd be like, we well, already bought everything. Right? So you have to find the right person at the right time. Whereas with the individual consumer, it's not as dependent on some like external thing like moving. But it's still something we gotta think about. There's definitely 
As I'd argue, this is a big opportunity right person at the right time, right? Yeah, I don't need an iPhone case, so you couldn't yeah. sell them to me. Yeah. Somebody else might. It's just one at a time. And I'm hard to pull totally get from the subscriber. We actually got the idea for the desk collection from a corporation. So um, the guy I used to play basketball with in, in college, he's uh, one of the co-founders of Airbnb. So I went down to visit him, and he had like $200 million to spend. So he had like, this ridiculous office, right? And he showed me around. Okay? Like There's like an airplane wing sticking out. All the fridges are really small and different colors for no reason. <laughs> And we're walk, me and my business partner were walking around getting this tour, and they had all these shiny iMacs. And we noticed they were all being propped up on like phone books and shoeboxes. <laughs> and both of us had the idea like right away. Like this design focused company, infinite money, <clears throat> can't find the product. So and that's what I'm, I'm in Fortel and we're in a software startup, and I know a lot of millennial dudes in software startups that have more money than they want to do with. Yeah. Well, that's what. That's why I asked the question about the idea. Just curious if you guys know anything about the short That's a great question. Um, we don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we did throw some advantage and check out people into that cyber stalking phase. Uh, um, yeah. Basically, we found out a lot of them are international, actually. So one of the things that is surprising about our company is that 40% of our revenue comes from international orders. And a lot of the band of checkouts are actually international. It's usually stuff like shipping and customers. I don't know if it's the crossing of things. That's the thing to do But yeah, the domestic folks that are band of checkout, yeah, we don't know. We don't know what was supposed to happen. But we did ask a good question. We did. That reminds me of a good question that I totally forgot in my presentation. So uh, a friend of mine sent me some advice on how to ask your customers about like what's really making them convert. If you just ask somebody like why did you buy it? Or if you ask the general crowd like why didn't you buy it, you might get like an eighteen year old who's like, it's too expensive, but they're not your customer, right? So what we did is we're, we're going to actual customers, talking to them, and then we ask them, Hey, what made you almost not? So people start talking about like what was going through their head. They're like, oh, I love the design, but it was a little bit expensive, and you know, I know it's worth it, but and that was the whole that was the story we heard over and over. Is they bought it, they still bought it, but they were thinking about price. price, price, price. It's a great question. Are all of your uh, desk buyers um, they already own like one of your other smaller items? Uh, or is there a correlation there? Oh, there's a chunk that they originally found us because of iPhone back in the day. They just stayed on our newsletter and have them on some social and as we launch the product. And we're trying to convert. Like we have kind of a funnel that's directing people that are interested in iPhone cases to our company. You know, we're fortunate to have that, right? It's really hard to get people coming in. And then we're trying to switch to this different product line. So we're like trying to get them to like go over this one. Yeah. <laughs> This, this, I mean, it seems so incredibly intimate, and these people are so connected. I mean, they seem like very progressive work style. Do you ever worry at all that, like, when you grow, which is the, the, the point, right? Like, when you get bigger, do you ever worry that you lose that intimacy when you do, and how do you control that? How do you not lose it, I guess? You know, like, I'm yeah. always like, wondering, like what, what's the battle there? Because it's like, right. you need so well, connected with these people. I'm kind of a. You mean to our own team? No, to, like to the yeah, your own team and to the okay. people that are buying your products. They seem to love it because it's very unique to them. But when you're selling it on a massive level to so many people, does it lose its uniqueness? And do you do you care if you're making huge money? Like sure, I guess sure. there's a weird balance. I have a trick trick answer, and um, it's that I, I personally don't care that much about the size of the company. Uh, it's not why I'm doing this. So we're not that motivated to grow. So I'm not really worrying about like. What if we're a two hundred million dollar company? We're a two million dollar company, and it's a lot of fun. I think we need to grow a little bit more to be financially healthy, but uh, I'm not thinking about that. But even at our scale, uh, our relationship with the customers is very distant. So what I used to do with furniture is I would make a custom piece for you. So I go over to your house. We talk about your dining table. You want it in this wood. To know each other, and I'd make a piece for you, and you probably pay me more than you pay at IKEA because of our connection, right? So when we started this product company, suddenly I had to shift to where it was anonymous. And it was so anonymous that um, 
instead of making this effort to get to know them, like the story now, it was just kind of like disconnected. So, did that, did that answer your question? A little meandering. Uh, yeah. What's your what's your current marketing plan now and plan for growth? <laughs> We're trying to figure that out. I think the number one thing that keeps me up at night is finding new, getting new eyes on the product. And uh, we don't know really. You know, we're investigating the e-commerce space, seeing if we can find something that works. But I think the key is going to be this, because we already have a customer base. We need to find new people, yes, but what is that overlap? And I don't have an answer for you because we haven't. <laughs> Have you ever seen on LinkedIn those pictures of some like new employees desk? We welcome them to here, and there's all depending on the size of the company, the swag to do it that. I was kind of chuckle at those because it's really not why you're there for the setup, right? You should work at a job because it's something you care about or do, but if you could somehow sponsor it or get in there, just find your products there, brought to you by, then you're not only getting my eyeballs as a consumer and an individual, mm -hmm. but you're also getting an entire workspace looking at it. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, we, we get that answer a lot. <laughs> like when you talk to the customers, they're like, oh, "We're just jealous." And they say, yeah, it's fine. I wonder if that's why people buy a product. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about that too is what you're seeing it, what that person experiencing it for the first time. It's, it could even be setup. Yeah. 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 Yeah.